listening to the Ocean Rowing Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Painter, physical therapist and owner of Strong and Empowered Rowing. I help people continue their love of rowing without aches and pains. Along the way, I decided I wanted to row across the Atlantic Ocean. I'm finding it super hard to get in touch with previous ocean rowers and find the answers on how to make this possible. So this podcast is to share my story and what I learn as I get ready for and ultimately cross the Atlantic Ocean. Hear from experts in different areas and from others who have completed ocean rows. So anyone who wants to do this has easy access and we can share our stories with the world. All of a sudden, I saw a wave building up a little bit behind the boat and it was just a funny shape and it was behaving differently. Um, the waves in the middle of the ocean don't come in uniform ranks towards you. They just pile on you from everywhere. And it just didn't look right. So I shouted to her to, to say there's a big wave coming. And thank goodness she whipped around and shut the hatch behind her because if she hadn't, our whole story could have had a completely different ending. All right, so you just heard from Rachel Smith, who is our guest for this episode. Uh, I had a blast talking to her. She rode the Atlantic as a pair uh, in 2007. Took them 76 days, 11 hours, and 12 minutes to cross. Uh, And she talks about, of course, favorite foods, milestones um, as she goes through and how she and her partner commemorated those milestones, uh, as well as her capsizing experience. And I also ask about any other tips that she's got and her stories. So this is one of those first episodes where I started to put a focus on the stories. uh, And I'm really excited I did everything from cloud searching um, to different ways that her life changed when she got back from rowing. Um, So learned a lot from her. Really excited. You should definitely listen to this episode and I hope you enjoy. Um, So thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate it. You being here. Um, I'll start with some questions, but then we just kind of free flow from there. Um, is there anything that you want to share with future ocean rowers, uh, that you wish you knew before you started your ocean rowing? Uh, I guess probably one of the biggest things is you never know where the decision to row an ocean will take you. Obviously it'll take you across an ocean, but you just, you never know how many opportunities it's going to open up for you and how it can change your life if you let it. Um, there's kind of two different sorts of people. Some people just want the adventure and they'll go home and just live and have had that amazing experience. But there's other people who really, it does, it genuinely changes your life. And if I look back now to 12 years ago, the, the people that are my friends now, my job, the things I do in my spare time, all of those decisions kind of link back to making that decision to row an ocean. So you just, you don't know where it's going to take you and interestingly um, I did a a talk before the row with a a group of coaches uh, sort of life life and performance coaches and they asked me a question that no one else had ever asked me which was um, what are you going to do when you when you finish the row and I had never even contemplated this because everything was so focused on the row and it really floored me this question because I was just like oh uh I don't know. Well, I'm going to go back to work. And that was it. That was the extent of my planning for when I finished with the row was I'm going to go back to work (laughs) and nothing else had been thought about. And to be fair, I didn't really think about it too much and probably I I should have done. And I would advise people to think about, you know, chat to, to other rowers about how they felt and how the row affected them and how that impacts on your life when you come back, because it has quite a dramatic effect. And You know, I I remember for about six months, I I was um, very kind of very emotional and very sort of little things would really get to me. Sort of like people getting in the way in the supermarket would make me really angry. (laughs) And I had no patience with people that were worrying about things that really didn't need worrying about. So perhaps you need to sort of uh, prepare yourself for, for those kind of emotions when you come back from something like this. 
Um, the other bit of advice probably, um, never ever think that you're going to conquer an ocean. You're not. <laughs> um, it will let you pass mm -hmm. and remember it can kill you. And it's, it's no joke out there. You know, the ocean can kill you if it chooses to. Normally, it'll push you to the ends of your limits and beyond and it'll let you pass. <laughs> that is great. Um, I love how it shifted your priorities. So when you came back, what really changed besides the emotional part? I think um, the whole project, because it because it was a massive project, and we approached it as a sort of not for profit business, um, which I can probably talk about later on as well. Um, but yeah, it, it does shift your priorities. It it sort of makes you understand what's really important in life. Probably a little bit like what we're going through at the moment with the whole lockdown situation, where people are starting to appreciate it's a hug or a a conversation with somebody that that's what's really important and I suppose out on the ocean um, I think Sally said it as well that life's actually very simple you eat you sleep you row and you survive and you fix things that are broken and that is your life you know and I think more for women than for men those phone calls home are really, really important. Having that contact with home is really vital. Um, not all women, but some women, you know, we, we, we thrive on that communication. Um, I think a lot of the men find that more of a distraction, but, you know, we certainly lived from phone call to phone call and text messages were, were the most exciting part of our day. And I think, you know, the whole experience did sort of put it into perspective that, when you go to the supermarket and they haven't got your brand of washing powder in, it really isn't the end of the world, <laughs> you know? Life will go on, it won't suddenly stop. And I think, you know, it was that kind of thing. And I think one other aspect was um, that, so doing the row was the best and the worst thing that I've ever done. And it was definitely the hardest. And I think that it, it puts that in perspective as well, that we've, we face difficulties every single day, but most of them are overcomable <laughs> and they're not going to kill you if you get it wrong. So it, it, it almost made me a bit blasé about certain things. So about a year after I did the row, uh, I decided to, to do a marathon kayak thing with my cousin, raising money for a hospital in Manchester in the UK. And we decided to to row Loch Lomond in Scotland, Windermere in England in the Lake District and Bala Lake which is in Wales. So in total it's about 39 miles of paddling and we wanted to do it against the clock and we trained for it you know we, we had to go in a, a two-man kayak because neither of us had paddled one before but that didn't really phase me because I'd never rowed before I decided to row an ocean, not really built for it anyway. <laughs> And uh, kayaking, I've done a lot of, but not as a two-person boat. Um, so we, we trained, we sort of did a, a 10 and a half mile paddle every week to sort of train for it. We did, our, our throwing ourselves in the deep end was that we just entered a race that was 16 miles after we'd had half an hour in the boat just to see what would happen, because that would give us a starting point. So this is sort of where the kind of, well, I've read an ocean, this can't be as bad, kind of comes into it, I guess. That's a starting point. So, so, <laughs> We didn't fall in, so that was that was a good start, and we got through the the race, and we actually came first in our class, which is the mixed doubles class. Um, but you know that that was just a, a practice for us, and then we did the training and and did the challenge. And I remember a couple of weeks before, I spoke to my cousin, and and he said, "Oh, how are you feeling about it?" I was like, Meh, "Well, it's only going to hurt for a day, isn't it?" <laughs> and then I thought, "Oh my God, that's terrible to to think it's a, you know is that the right attitude to have." You know, I mean, we'd put a lot of preparation into it and, and a lot of that came from doing the row, you know, leaving no stone unturned. But the, the mental attitude that I had was just like, well, be fine. It's only going to hurt a bit, ache for a couple of days afterwards. That'll be it. And, you know, like if I'd have done that a few years before, my attitude, I think, would have been completely different. I would have been overwhelmed by this paddling challenge on these lakes. But, you know, after rowing an ocean, it was sort of be all right. It's fine. We'll get it, get through it. <laughs> so I guess in, in terms of changing perspectives, it, it, it does that. It does make you understand what's really important in your life and it's the people around you. Um, it, and, and then 
things like that, you know, attempting other things, it, it kind of gives you a bit of a, a boost, you know, things that you might have said no to before, you'll now say, actually, why not? Let's give it a go. What's the worst that can happen? Is it going to kill me? No. Worst things happen at sea. And so I don't know. Does that answer the question? Uh, it's perfect. <laughs> your answer is perfect. Because uh, it's your answer, which is what I like. <laughs> uh, That is a very good perspective of it. Um, and I love how <clears throat> it's opening you up to more opportunities because you're more willing to take them as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and it totally it makes like you go into those opportunities less fearfully as well. And yeah. with more preparation because you know how to prepare and you know, you do think what's the worst that can happen. So I don't get the job that I've applied for. So I don't, this doesn't happen. It can't kill me. So, you know, <laughs> it just shifts it all. That's great. <clears throat> it does. Uh, it is like COVID. I'm, I'm actually enjoying this because I think people are focusing more on them. Yeah. Uh, and I think that people are realizing what their priorities are in a similar way. And yeah. that's going to be amazing and see what happens from people making that shift. Yeah. I hope it lasts though, because, you know, I think probably in six months they'll sort of forget, you know, how it felt to be locked down and, you know, they'll be back to normal, but hopefully some good will come out of it. So. For me, it's like the same. I just don't go out to eat as often. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm like, oh, I already kind of live at my house. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's see. What's the next question? Um, dun, dun, dun. Ah, you were a dragon boat racer, but you haven't rowed. How did you go from dragon boat racing to rowing an ocean? That's an interesting question. So yeah, I started dragon boating um, when I was 16 and we, we, at school you go into sort of a college or a sixth form between 16 and 18 and they offered canoeing and kayaking as a, as a games option on a Wednesday afternoon. And if you signed up for it, you got to miss a lesson to go kayaking, which seemed like a really great idea to me. So, so I did. Um, and our coach went over to China and came back saying we've got this amazing sport called dragon boat racing we're going to get a boat we're going to set up a team and we were 16 17 we said well yeah what's what's really in it for us and he said it's weekends away without your parents so sign us up where do we where do we put our names down um so yeah i mean i'd never been good at sport at school i'm five foot and a bit and i'm kind of curvy and i can't run but kayaking was a sport that I took to quite quickly. It, it suited my body shape. Um, I'm, I like the water. So when we started the dragon boat team, it was kind of a natural progression really. And I did that for a couple of years and then moved away. And it was only when I moved back a few years later after university that <clears throat> I went back to the, the coach and said, oh, you know, I've got, I've got my evenings free. I fancy coming back canoeing again. And he said, well, we're taking the dragon boat to China next year, taking a team out for the first ever world, you know, official world championships. And I thought, well, you know, that sounds like fun because I've never been to China and I like Chinese food. Well, I thought I did. <laughs> yeah, it's very different. I went to China and there was very few <clears throat> things I could eat. <laughs> yeah. Well, where this world championships w was held isn't far from where the whole virus things exploded from. So we, the less we say about what was in the markets, the better, I think. But we went out to China and uh, it, was, it was just the most surreal experience because out there, dragon boaters are treated like uh, football players or soccer players over here are, are treated. You know, they, they stop the cars to let you cross the road. It's, it was just amazing, you know, and we were sort of, we're just these guys from England and we do this in our spare time. But, you know, over there, they're professionals. You know, they, that's what they do. That's their job. Yeah. So we went and, you know, the, our best result was ninth in the mixed 500 meters. And I remember this feeling of we've just come ninth in the whole world. Like this, this is like that single figures. This is amazing. Like what if we had got a medal? you know, like that, oh my God, that would be so cool. And that was really a, a sort of pivotal point because it made me decide that I wanted to carry on with the dragon boating and see where that would take me. So every year we either had world championships or 
European Championships. And over the years, so between 1995 and 2003, I think I did six World Championships, no, five World Championships and three Europeans. And then I did another Worlds in 2005 and another one in 2011. So on and off, I've been to seven Worlds and three European Championships and won 25 medals along the way, which isn't bad for the little girl who's really rubbish at sport. <laughs> That's huge. Congratulations. Thank you. So in that time, um, one of our teammates for a couple of years is a lady called Deborah Searle. Well, she's called Deborah Searle now. Um, quite a famous lady in the world of ocean rowing um, because she rowed solo. So I think it was, I can't remember what year it was now, but she basically set off with her then husband. She to wrote row a book. Across. Yeah, she's okay. written a book. Yeah. Um, and she set off with her husband. He developed a massive phobia of the ocean, so it incapacitated him. It must have been horrible for him. But she was kind of enjoying herself, so she carried on on her own. So we followed, because, I mean, you know, our, our impression of this was, that's crazy. Who, who does a thing like this? And then when she did it on her own, we were just like, Deborah, that's insane. <laughs> like, how did you do this? And so every time I saw Deborah after she'd done this challenge, and I, I met her at the boat show in, in, down south and had a chat with her and bought her book. And, you know, she told me a bit about it. And she said to me, you know, Rach, you, you should think about this. You're, you're the right sort of person for this. You would love it out there. And like any normal person, I sort of went, <laughs> get over yourself, Deborah, like I'd ever do a thing like that. But then a friend of mine, my, my best friend, Lynn, and I, we'd been talking for a long time about doing a challenge for charity. So, you know, we'd looked at cycles and treks and all sorts of different things. And none of them really sort of got hit us in the right way. And then over a period of time, this idea of rowing an ocean and raising money for charity kind of morphed into one thing. And so Lynn had actually tried to set up a, a project with another person and it just didn't work out from the beginning. And then one day I was at her house and I remember sitting and the sun was coming through the windows and she sort of said, oh, it's not really working out with this, this other person. So, you know, what, what do you think? Do you think you could do it? And I'd just missed out on a promotion at work and I thought the world was against me and clearly had nothing to lose by jacking in my job. So I don't think I actually said yes ever, but it's a bit late now. So that was kind of how it started really. The, the idea came from Deborah and she was, she was a really big part of our project in terms of the encouragement and some of the message that we got from her when we were out at sea were incredible. They really, really helped. So Every time we were in the middle of the ocean thinking, this is horrible, why are we here? We hate every minute of this. We were like, whose idea was this? Deborah's, yes, we'll blame Deborah. <laughs> so she has a lot to answer for, um, but we're still friends, so that's okay. <laughs> that's positive. <laughs> yeah. Um, I find it amusing how a lot of people get into a sport that ends up being part of their life from school. Or like from a, hey, it was a way to get out of class. Or yeah. <laughs> uh, like for me, it was like crew was in school, but it was a means to an end. It was I had to do a sport. And I, I find it amusing how some of those carry over to people through their life, whereas others it's like, oh, okay, I did this, I'm done kind of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, we didn't have any rowing teams at my school, um, just the, the canoe club. Um, and when I when we decided to row, Lynn and I, we, we were both dragon boaters and obviously in a dragon boat, you face forward and you paddle on one side. In an ocean rowing boat, you face backwards and you've got an oar in both hands. So we had to learn to row and we, we agreed that we didn't need to be world beaters, we just needed to be competent. We needed to be able to row for two hours um, and we needed to not injure ourselves while we were rowing on bumpy water. So we both went down to rowing clubs. So she was in London and I was in Chester, which is in the northwest of England. And I remember walking in, I'd spoken to somebody on the phone and I sort of walked in and went, hi, I'm Rachel. And I looked up at them and they were all about six foot six, bearing in mind I'm about five foot one. And I you know, cricked my neck looking up at them and, and said, I'm Rachel, I'm, I'm here because I'm going to row across the ocean. And they literally laughed in my face. 
That's so, so sad. Yeah. But then, you know, very, very quickly, they, I mean, they, lit, they threw me into a fine boat straight away on the first night. And I guess because I'm used to being in boats on the water, I was, I was okay. I could balance the boat. Um, oars are actually quite good as big sticky out things to balance yourself, which you don't have in a kayak <laughs> or not quite the same. So, you know, I'm never going to be a world beater in rowing because I'm just not the right shape and size for it. But I learned enough to be competent. I did a few races and I was women's captain for the club. So the ones that left had to uh, take it all back in the end. Well done. Yeah, I'm five foot three and curvy. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, how did I row in division one? It was a walk on team. So <laughs> people who you just had to want to be there to get on. I was like, okay, I want to be here. Uh, that's awesome. And being captain is pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, I haven't really rowed since, to be fair. And that's it fair. took me the best part of a year to get back on a rowing machine in the gym. I just couldn't, couldn't really face it. But, you know, I use it regularly now. And we, we have boats at home that we, we take out, not rowing boats, but various, well, most of our garage is filled with kayaks and canoes of various descriptions. So there's plenty of boats we can use. It's still a water activity. It's, it's a yeah. similar concept. It's just how are you moving that's slightly different. But yeah. the concept of I'm still, I'm on the water, there's the serene, there's the peacefulness, mm-hmm. there's the uh, adventure. It, it's all kind of similar. Yeah. And stand up paddleboard, that's going to be the next thing. I had two goes at that last year and I loved it. So Did you fall? I mean, no. Good no, job. Was good. <laughs> it was I've close only, a couple of times. <laughs> I've only done it twice. The first time I was good. The second time, uh, these people went in with horses into Uh, the lake and they were like training the horses to, I guess, go through the water. And I had never seen that before. So all of a sudden I'm like, why are there horses in the water? And I went flying. (laughs) I was like, okay, I guess I'm wet. (laughs) But. No, that was great fun. So I can imagine that's going to be the next addition to the the waterborne family in the garage. <clears throat> They're more expensive than I thought, surprisingly, like a paddleboard. I, I, I don't know what how much they are, actually. I haven't thought um, about that. I want to say they range, I don't know what it is in pounds, but between like 500 and 1500 US dollars. Yeah, that's probably about the same, I would imagine. But uh yeah, we'll say what well, one day. <laughs> yeah, I expected it to be like, oh, I can go get one for like $150. No. <laughs> um, awesome. <coughs> dun, dun, dun. Okay, so I gave you warning for this question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was curious if you'd be willing to talk about how towards the end of your um, crossing, you had a capsize experience and if you'd be willing to share that with us. Absolutely. Um, and I think it's probably a, a really important one as well. So some of the points that came out of it. So we, um, we were 300 miles from the finish line and we knew it was 300 miles because we were big on rewarding ourselves for hitting goals. And in the last hundred, well, thousand miles, every hundred miles, we had either a mini bottle of champagne or do you have Bailey's over there? Uh-huh. It's like a whiskey cream drink. So they sell mini ones. They don't have to be refrigerated. We took loads of those with us. That's a great tip for any rowers. Take Bailey's minis with you because they're lightweight. And you can hide them in your bags. So um, so we'd, we'd got our whatever it was that day, Bailey's mini out to, to have with our lunch to celebrate having 300 miles left to go. And I was rowing. And it was really rough. We had spoken to the race organizer in the morning and asked what the forecast was because it was just 20 to 30 foot waves breaking over the boat. We'd had a knockdown the night before. Um, so we'd gone over 90 degrees. Um, it was, you know, it was at nighttime, it was really rough. It was too rough to be outside. Um, and we'd also done some research into where most of the capsizes had been in previous races. Mm. And it had been in the last third of the race, which could have been down to weather conditions changing, um, could have been down to the, the ocean sort of coming up against the shelf, or it could have been a little bit down to complacency. So are you at a point in the race where you're very comfortable being out at sea and you forget to clip on? 
Now we had a rule on our boat, which was if you were sat outside or if you were outside, you were clipped on with your harness. And lots of people don't. Lots of people think they get in the way. We used it from day one and we learned to cope with it. It, it didn't bother us. You know, it, it just was there. It was part of our kit. Um, a couple of days when it was quite flat, we did use a foot leash, like a surf leash, but then they're not really ideal for it. You know, they're, they're not load tested in the same way. They're not designed to work that way uh, because they're designed to work with a surfboard. So sailing harnesses are the, by far the best option. And funnily enough, the day before I'd come out of the cabin and sat sort of in our, our little, on top of our luggable loo, which has a little lid on it. So it served as a kind of toilet, seating area and kitchen combo. It was quite a cool little setup. And I'd sat there for about 20 minutes and I had my harness on and completely forgot that I wasn't clipped on. And then all of a sudden Lynn noticed that I wasn't clipped on and just said, oh my God, Rachel, you're not clipped on. And so that was changed very quickly. And it was a really good reminder because it was about the same time the next day that we did capsize. So I was rowing along quite happily, um, you know, watching these massive waves behind the boat. Lynn had just come out and she was going to start heating the water up for our lunch. And so we had the food out, we had the knives, well, the knives, forks and spoons, the spoons. <laughs> it wasn't like a sit down meal. <laughs> and all of a sudden I saw a wave building up a little bit behind the boat and it was just a funny shape and it was behaving differently. Um, the waves in the middle of the ocean don't come in uniform ranks towards you. They just pile on you from everywhere. And it just didn't look right. So I shouted to her to, to say there's a big wave coming. And thank goodness she whipped around and shut the hatch behind her. Because if she hadn't, our whole story could have had a completely different ending. And so this wave curled around and it hit us from the starboard side uh, and just broke over the top of the boat. And we could feel the boat scudding across the top of the waves because we didn't have a centerboard on our boat. So it was just sliding across the waves, but the wave was so quick, it literally just flipped us over. And it, it's a weird feeling because we never believed it would happen. We never thought it would happen. And I remember being under the water and seeing bubbles going upwards. So I knew where upwards was and the water was bright and clear. You know, it's, it's beautiful that far out at sea. And, uh, I sort of swam upwards and as I did, the boat had self-righted, thank goodness. And we kind of popped up next to each other and we sort of grabbed our arms and did a quick tap, da tap down to make sure everything was still attached. And we looked at each other and said, what the just happened there? And of course, we're both in the water and the boat's above us with water pouring out of the scuppers. And we just went, well, we, we've obviously capsized. And then we burst out laughing. And we were just like, this is ridiculous. Like we've capsized, we're in the middle of the ocean and like what's going on? And then Lynn's dinner floated past and it was cod and potato. And by that point of the trip, cod and potato was a luxury meal. So she grabbed it and threw it back in because uh, there's no, no leaving that one behind. Um, I wish we'd taken some ketchup though. That would have been good with cod and potato ketchup. So another, another good point. So we're, we're there sort of laughing because it's just ridiculous. We're bobbing around in the ocean 300 miles from anywhere. So we, you know, we're like, well, what do we do? The only thing you can do is get back in the boat, get everything together and carry on, really. So I climbed back in and did a good impression of a slithery fish over the side. Um, we'd broken an oar that was kind of flapping around and I untangled Lynn because she was wrapped up in some bungee that we had our water tanks um, on the deck, held onto the deck with. Uh, and got her up on the deck and we did a quick recce to see what we'd lost um, which bizarrely every single thing that we'd lost we had a spare of so we'd lost we broke an oar we lost a compass a pair of sunglasses a drinks bottle and the lid off the toilet seat and we had a spare of every single one of those items what we didn't have a spare of was the kettle the spoons and I mean, we had a spare burner for the cooker, but we only had one cooker and they had somehow miraculously wedged themselves under opposite gunnels and they were saved. Wow. Which was amazing. So there's there definitely a guardian angel looking out for us that day. 
and we we tidied up and had a, a bit of a sort of thing we had our lunch because we said you know can't make decisions on an empty stomach we need to decide what to do now are we going to give up and we didn't want to you know we'd we, we were very shaken up. There's, there's no two ways about it. I had a huge bruise on my arm. And the only thing that could have caused that bruise was the steel rowing seat, which if it had hit the top of my arm, it was obviously very close to my head under the water. And that was quite a sobering thought because if it had hit my head, I probably wouldn't be here, but it didn't, it hit my arm. So, you know, that. but you sort of think we can carry on, but if this happens again, are we going to be as lucky? You know, your luck runs out at some point. So if it happens again, a second time or a third time, you know, what the risk is increasing, isn't it? So we had our lunch and then Lynn got on the oars and I went into the cabin to phone the race organiser. And uh, I remember, I remember the conversation and he says he knew right from the start that we were okay. Cause he, he said, I knew from your voice that you were okay. And so the first thing he said was, wow was it a full 360 that's amazing <laughs> i was like yeah we're fine by the way we're okay <laughs> so um so yeah we we told the race organizer what had happened and they said you know there's, there's no way we can send the support boats back because they're already in antigua it'll take them five days to get back to you and you'll be there by then because of the the conditions and so we realized we were kind of on our own out there um, we also asked them not to tell our families because our families were about to, to fly out to Antigua and they were really excited, as, as were we. And we just thought, you know, they, they can't do anything to change it. We can't do anything to change what's happened. But if we tell them, they're just going to be beside themselves with worry. And we, we can't do that to them. So that last week at sea was incredibly difficult because every time we spoke to them, we just wanted to tell them all about it and we couldn't, we had to keep it to ourselves. The only other person that we told about it was Deborah. And she straight away, there was a string of text messages and then an email. And, you know, we, we did a lot of coaching and the dragon boating together. And one of the big things that we worked on was visualization skills and not just picturing something but what's it going to feel like what's it going to sound like taste like look like and you build up a really sensory experience of what the thing you're trying to achieve is going to be like and she said you know think of all those things that you've you've coached yourselves with and that you've worked on and she said your movie doesn't end this way run that through through your head you know when you arrive seeing your families there what's the first hug going to feel like and you know the what she said to us really just made us so determined to carry on you know we'd already decided to carry on but it just gave us that that boost that we really needed because we couldn't talk to anyone else about it but she knew because she'd been out at sea on her own so she understood it and and that's really what got us through that last week you know it it was really hard it was probably the worst week for me because there was this anxiety that it's already happened, so it could happen again. And we, the chances of us being that lucky a second time are negligible, aren't they? So that, that worry was constantly there and the conditions were terrible. It was just really big waves, day and night, and a constant battle. And I remember thinking that, you know, I wanted to enjoy every minute out there. I knew it was gonna to come to an end soon and I didn't want it to. And I remember feeling, you know, like I really want to enjoy this and I'm just hating it. I just want to get there now. And it's like a sort of internal dialogue saying like, but you've got to make the most of every single minute out here because you're never going to get this experience again, probably. So, you know, it, it was a really emotional sort of week. And the morning after, so the night we capsized in the middle of the day and as it got dark, we decided that we'd be a bit kind to ourselves. Um, and... So we put the sea anchor out, um, which sort of turns you into the prevailing conditions. And we'd tidied all the cabin because it all got a bit messed up with the knockdown the night before as well. And we'd, we'd dropped some little perfume drops around and we picked out our favourite food. And we had our little bottles of Baileys that we hadn't had chance to have at lunchtime. And we put some music on and we listened to some comedy podcasts. And we just had a nice evening, you know, and we we were kind to ourselves and we looked after ourselves and the next morning we got up and we were sort of full of resolve after the messages from Deborah that we were going to do this. We had 300, less than 300 miles to go. 
you know, there's no way that Neptune, because we're girls, we can't give everything a name, don't we? So Neptune wasn't going to have his, his way, you know, he wasn't going to break us, we were going to do it. And so, you know, I remember pulling the sea anchor in and there was a point when we were broadside to the waves and that was quite nerve wracking. And then we literally just put the oars out and got cracking and we made, you know, Antigua, here we come kind of thing. I really like how you took time for yourself. Uh, it's, it's like just in every day, like if you don't take time for yourself, you're just getting, increasing that stress, increasing everything. And the fact that you did that is... Yeah, and I, it was kind of unconscious, really. I think it, it was just what felt right at the time, you know. And um, I'd I'd got a couple of cards that people had given me. Uh, my partner had given me one that said nine 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 for emergency use only. So that would be nine one one for our American <laughs> listeners or Canadian listeners. And um, so I hadn't opened it, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to open it because if now isn't an emergency moment, so I don't know what is. And it, it was it was interesting because we both had a good cry, but I was struggling to kind of let go with that. And I thought, I'm going to open this card because that's going to set me off. And I need that release of emotion because it's it's just, it needs to come out. Um, and it, it did the trick. But, you know, that, that was, you know, in, immediately afterwards, we went into sort of power mode and we were organizing and getting everything right and making decisions and checking what we'd lost and all that kind of thing, a very practical approach. And then afterwards, when you have time to, you know, the adrenaline subsides and you reflect on what's happened and you realize how lucky you were. And that's when we, we kind of got a bit emotional about it. But then, you know, looked after ourselves, gave ourselves just a bit of a break and then ready to go again the next day. You know, maybe a little bit wobbly, but, you know, we did it. Well, I'm glad to hear that you were both okay from it. <laughs> and thank we you were. for sharing it. <laughs> no uh, problem. Is, did you say the seat is what hit you here? Yeah, so our rowing seats were attached. So the runners are quite wide um, okay. on the boat. So it was on a, a, a sort of custom built steel framework, which was really heavy duty. Now the, frame, the, the steel frame was on a lanyard attached to the boat. So as we rolled over, it would have been waving around in the water round about where my head was. So it's basically like the seat came <clears throat> off and is attached yeah. by a lanyard. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you imagine it's all upside down, the seat would be hanging down yeah. and I was sort of in the water about the same height because I was attached as well. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, again, stay clipped on. If, if we hadn't been clipped on, who knows what would have happened. Um, Good thing the day before was the day yeah. that you weren't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. That is crazy. So yeah, definitely a guardian angel looking after us that day, I think. So, um, Is there anything going forward or after that that you would have changed minus the clipping in for people to be aware of, like keeping things away or? Yeah, I mean, I think the reason we lost so few things is because everything was tied down on the deck. So everything was behind netting. Um, things are in uh, waterproof bags, which obviously have some buoyancy in them. Um, we were quite tidy on board the boat and consequently we didn't lose very much. The sunglasses we lost had been on my head. So there's some dolphin somewhere happily sporting an expensive pair of Bolly sunglasses <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, and, you know, probably a whale using our toilet lid as a, as a hat. Um, but yeah, so, so everything that everything that we lost was loose on the deck or just loosely clipped in like the compass. Um, but we, we had spares of it all. So we were very lucky. Um, I'm trying to think if there was anything else. I think just consider it as a possibility. So one of the things we did in our preparation, because we worked with a coach that we'd worked with in dragon boating and we looked at possible things that could happen and came up with strategies mm -hmm. so think about if you do capsize what is going to be your strategy to recover from that and hopefully it'll never happen and you'll never have to use it but having if you consider it as a possibility come up with a couple of things you know how how will you cope with it how will it make you feel how will you cope with the fear of it because we're not very good at coping with fear these days it's not something that we've we genuinely experience very often yeah you know cavemen did 
with the saber toothed tiger around the corner waiting for them. But we we don't really know how we react to real fear, do we? So that was something I had some coaching on as well. That that worried me because I didn't know how I'd react in a in a fearful situation. Um, but turns out I just crack on with it. <laughs> yeah, I know how I react to a snake fear. I run away, <laughs> which probably won't help me in the ocean. <laughs> Well, hopefully there won't be any snakes. <laughs> uh, somebody asked me, I've talked to somebody who did um, biking across, like across the country mm-hmm. um, and like through the mountains of a country. And she's like, I would never cross an ocean. I would do this. I was like, I wouldn't bike across the U.S. because there's snakes everywhere. I was <laughs> like, I picked one without the snakes. <laughs> so, it's yeah. interesting how we choose our adventures. Um, yeah let's see all right um so are there any other stories that you would like to share i talked to another um who is i think it was gwen uh i don't know if her podcast came out yet or if it's about to come out uh but she mentioned how she'd love to hear stories from other ocean rowers i know we've talked about a couple of them uh but are there any other ones that you want to share (laughs) Gosh, there's probably a million stories. Um, and I'm willing to do a second podcast <laughs> on stories if I need to. Um, but it's it's a shift that I thought was a good direction to kind of also include. Let me try and think of a few because some of them are some of them are really boring stories. Because some days it is really boring out at sea, and you literally, I mean, some days you see some wildlife, whether it's birds or whales or dolphins or turtles. I love turtles. And it's like the most exciting thing in the world when you see some wildlife. And other days you're just running along going, just a bird, anything, just something, just, it's just, there's nothing, you know, and you, you just, you want a bit of company and there's just nothing. It's just sky and sea and your rowing partner. If you haven't murdered them by that point, you know. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, the, the wildlife was really amazing and dolphins are very camera shy. So I never got any pictures of dolphins, but the turtles and the whales were amazing. And the whales would, you know, I mean, they're bigger than the boats and we'd see them coming through the waves behind us and they'd dive underneath the boat and then they'd go and breathe a little way away and they'd swim round. And, you know, there was a mum and a baby one day and we could just imagine this little conversation like, look, Junior, it's two naked women in a pink boat. You're never going to see this again. So, you know, the, it, it's just amazing, the, the wildlife and that sort of thing. Um, interestingly, on our last night, I was in the cabin just about to go out and take over from Lynn. Um, I think we were just almost in sight of Antigua at this point as well. And I was lying there and I could hear her going, shh, 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 like shooing noises. I was thinking, she's singing, because we used to sing a lot, you know, neither of us can actually sing, but we used to sing at the top of our voices. And I could hear her like flapping something around. I was like, what is going on? Anyway, I went out and apparently a bird had flown down right next to her and it was literally flying next to her face and she was trying to shoo it away without waking me up and it wouldn't disappear at all. So she's just flopping a, a rope at it to try and get it to go away and it was just right next to her head, sort of eyeball to eyeball flying with her. So, um, so that was quite a funny one. Uh, there was one night where we... So the waves change every, every day, you know, but you'll see little patterns. So you might see at six o'clock every night, the waves go really gnarly for half an hour and then they go back to normal for six or seven days and then they just stop and you never see that pattern again. Um, also, here's an interesting one. So I never realized this until I rode an ocean, but you know, they say every snowflake is, the set, is, is individual, it's no two alike, but science has proved that's not the case. Mm-hmm every sunset and sunrise is completely unique because there's no way that you could ever recreate the conditions exactly. Hmm. So they're absolutely unique. So we got to see 76 sunrises and sunsets that were completely unique. So that's kind of special. Um, But this one particular night, uh, it was quite windy and the waves are about 10 feet high and they were coming at us like ranks of soldiers marching towards us. They were going so fast 
that we, we couldn't row. We literally just had to sit there and hang on to the sides and steer because it was catching the, the oars and taking them past our heads too quickly. So we literally, for the whole night, we just sat there steering and it was like a never ending roller coaster. It was just continual, one wave after another, after another, after another, absolutely uniform and going so fast. It was just, you were just hanging on thinking, oh my God, when is this going to stop? You know, and it's pitch black out there. There's no, there's no light at all. And the next day we, we spoke to uh, another crew and they said, blimey girls what you know what on earth were you doing last night how fast were you rowing you know you were the fastest moving boat in the fleet and we'd done something like 29 miles in six hours or something oh, ridiculous wow. and we're still like yeah and maybe we shouldn't tell them that we didn't actually put an oar in the water then because <laughs> they're a boys team and they'd be a bit upset but yeah it was just it was mental it was just like this never-ending roller coaster just one after another after another just continually for the whole night and then we never saw those again. Never saw that. That's what made you stay on top versus go into the cabin for that? Uh, because as long as you could keep lined up, it was moving us in the right direction really quickly. Okay. Um, and we were going faster without rowing than we would have been if we were rowing. Yeah. And we were getting closer to Antigua that way. Yeah. And that's what it's all about, you know. Um, and it, it was... It was scary in one way, but we didn't feel like we were going to capsize or anything. You know, as long as you could stay lined up, you were surfing along quite happily. But it was just the relentlessness of it for so many hours that was amazing. And I suppose another story, um, we used to sort of time ourselves on, on our watches and it was so hot in the cabin to begin with. Well, when you were in the cabin, although it wasn't that warm, it was hotter than being outside. And I used to struggle. I'd wake up ready to go out and row. And then I'd literally sit there waiting till the last minute. And then I'd fall asleep sitting upright because I was so tired. And a couple of times I was a little bit late. So we arranged this sort of system where we'd shout for the other person. We'd give them like a 10 minute warning and then a two minute warning. And that worked really, really well and kept us both on time. And there was no sort of antagonism then. But I remember one time I was, uh, I used to watch the clouds a lot and we used to watch them in the daytime. Uh, one day we saw these, they were properly like cubes shaped clouds. I've no idea what, what conditions would make them form, but uh, we decided they were aliens poorly disguised as clouds one day. And this particular night, um, Lynn came out of the cabin. She said, I thought you were going to give me a call. She said, you, you're like five minutes late. I was like, oh, okay, but do you think that cloud looks more like a monkey face or Bart Simpson? <laughs> and I just completely missed the changeover because I was too busy trying to work out if a cloud looked more like a monkey face or Bart Simpson. We never did decide. <laughs> I love the simplicity of it. Like, yeah, clouds are great. You're looking for something to do, something to keep you entertained that's different. And like... I get lost staring at the sky often. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you have the time to do that and the time to appreciate it and have those debates. Yeah, it, it is. It's a funny one as well, because I suppose some people go out there thinking that you're going to sort out your life when you're out there. And I think some people are probably running away a little bit when they go out there. Um, I, I didn't really sort out anything while I was out there, but it laid the foundations for a lot of things when I came back. Yeah. So, you know, there is a lot of thinking time, but some, some days you literally, you're there, some days you're putting the world to rights and you, you're sorting out what am I going to do with my life and what's the meaning of the world and everything. And then other days you sit there and there's just nothing in your brain and you think, is there anything there? <laughs> no, nope. not a single thought. And then half an hour later, you're like, well, still nothing. <laughs> Uh, but again, you have the time to do that. You have the time to have a busy brain and then a time when you can just not think about anything. Um, I have a question that I didn't at, put on the sheet. Okay. Uh, did anything besides an aura break? Uh, lots of things. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard this from everybody. Auto helm? Uh, actually, no, because we didn't use an auto helm. Okay. So we, we just went for foot steering. So we uh, had a problem with our electrics about 10 days in. 
and um it, it's a fault i don't think it would happen now anyway because they've they've corrected it because sort of when we did it i mean ours was 12 years ago and we didn't really have social media then you know we weren't linked i think i had got a facebook account but twitter and instagram didn't exist then and um, we didn't actively use the facebook account for the row so if you're thinking about sort of the technology available at the time it was very different and a lot of it came from sailing so our batteries were sailing batteries um, not specifically for rowing because nothing is specifically for rowing so it was basically a problem with our regulator. So the sun was shining on the solar panels, the power was going to this regulator, and then that's where it was stopping and it wasn't filling up the batteries. So we had no power basically. And for three days, we had the emails going backwards and forwards, uh, trying to sort of solve this problem as to why we had no power. One night we ended up taping a torch to our navigation light and then just going without because we had no we had to stay awake you know someone had to keep watch all night and um, we tended to row anyway through the night but it was sort of keeping an extra eye open for any ships and we we had to hand pump water for a couple of hours one afternoon because we were getting low on our water supplies and we didn't want to use the the spare water which was the ballast because um then you can be penalized if you use over a certain amount so pumping water is not a lot of fun, uh, but we, we managed to solve the problem. So we, our electrician had done a wiring diagram and he sent us a list of instructions and we had to sort of take out some of the wires and reconnect them in a different way, which uh, we're not very technical. It was quite stressful. And, you know, when you look at the circuit board, it's got all that silver blobby stuff all over it and you're going towards it on something that's like being on the back of a bucking bronco <laughs> and you're trying to get a really fine screwdriver into a little tiny screw um so yeah not stressful in the slightest and i think what was most stressful about that situation was that we didn't really understand it so our electrician would say have you tried running some resistance through xyz and we were like i don't even know what that is you know but in the end it was the diagram that he'd done which kind of saved the day so we had problems with that um we had a, 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 a line that was controlling our rudder that was fraying. So on a calm day, we put um, a, a sort of reserve line in place so that it was ready in case it did snap. Um, and then just everything really doesn't work well with, with salt water. You know, we had to change wheels on the rowing seats. Um, we had to change one of the gates one day because that broke. That was quite close to finish. I think uh, it's it's the gate that the I don't know what you you might call it something different, but it's the the bit that the oar goes in on the side of the boat that you you clip it down and screw oh, it up. Okay, yeah. Um, so a gate, um, and I think that was probably damaged when we capsized, but it only sort of gave up a couple of days later. So that had to be changed, and all of these things because you're moving constantly when you're having to do any repairs like that it's it's a real effort because you need three points of contact really which if you're trying to screw something down or hold something and do something else with the other hand you, you're vulnerable really um we also we lost the we had to change the light bulb in our navigation light but in doing that we lost the cap off the light over the side so we improvised with a plastic bag taped over the top of it and then that blew away in the wind so we we cut the bottom off a juice bottle and taped that over the top of it and that's that's what got us the rest of the way. Nice. Yeah, I think you need to prepare for the fact that everything is going to break and salt water gets in everywhere and rots everything. So yeah, lots and lots of things broke, but we were quite lucky in that the rudder was was very strong on our boat and the and the setup that we had. Our rudder setup was very simple, which meant it was easy to fix, but it did cause us some problems with our feet when when the weather was really bad because it was putting a lot of strain on our joints but then I came up with the idea so we had some broken bungee cords so I tied knots in them to sort of overcome the the frayed bits and then I used it as kind of I, I don't even it's not even a technical thing I just made it up but like a damper so because we were using foot steering like you would in a normal rowing boat um it, it basically just softened the the strain on your it would it stopped it snapping across Okay. and just sort of softened that movement and we didn't need to be steering that accurately 
separately out at that point either. So you become very, very adept at fixing things. Um, so we, we had nicknames on the boat. So Lynn was Hawkeye because she could see anything on the horizon. Like she, she saw things. I was like, what, where's this ship? <laughs> and she'd be like, it's over there. It's the one with the blue sails. And you're like, I can't even see it. Um, so she was Hawkeye and I was fix it. So I'd come up with little ways. We made, um, when our salt sores on our bombs got really bad, I made little skirts out of carrier bags and duct tape. Um, and we tied it around our waist with cords. So it became like a little spray deck just to deflect the salt water. So very stylish, you know. Did it work? Yeah, yeah, it was really good actually. Yeah, it did work really well. So, so yeah, ocean rowing couture. <laughs> <laughs> Those are important little tidbits that help. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, is there anything else that you would want to share that we haven't shared? I, I wrote a list of things actually, but I think probably <laughs> the biggest thing is when you're approaching a project like this, um, the planning and the setup is crucial. So we treated it as a not-for-profit organization. Um, we were quite lucky. Lynn's an accountant and I'm a marketing person. Well, I'm not now. I'm paramedic now, completely different. But um, So we, we naturally sort of fell into those roles and used those skills. But the thing about sponsorship, whether you're doing it for a charity or not, is that people are not giving you money because they like you. They are buying a piece of you. You need to be operating as a business because when they give you money, it's a business transaction. Mm -hmm. They want something back in return. And it, you, you can't make false promises. So you can't promise them coverage in newspapers and other media outlets unless you have control over it. You can include them in press releases and you can mention them on your own social media, but you can't promise them things that you don't have control over the delivery of. And if you say that you're going to send them a newsletter every month, then you send them a newsletter every month. You know, whatever you, you lay out as part of that package, you have to deliver on. Um, we were very successful with our fundraising campaign. We put a lot of effort into it. Um, I, I'm going to share some of the documents on the awesome women page awesome. because the, the, we had a contract with our charity. We worked very closely. We had quarterly meetings. We had to supply accounts. And it was a very professional arrangement that we had with them. But we also made sure that, you know, we, we were getting the right amount of funds in the right place. And a lot of our sponsors were so happy with what we did that they gave us more than we asked for. You know, they'd see how hard we were working. And this is before social media, really. And, you know, we got extra clothing, extra sunglasses things like that you know that they they were so pleased with what we were doing that they offered us more things and um, we came up with some really innovative ideas as well and ways so we listed every item of equipment on the boat so if somebody wanted to buy a piece of equipment so our boat was second hand so we had a lot of that equipment already but if they wanted to give us um two thousand pounds for the solar panels well we already had the solar panels but we had to pay for the boat anyway so that money would would be earmarked for the solar panels and in fact harley davidson sponsored our solar panels <laughs> I Seriously? Still think we're the only it was harley davidson finance but i think we're the only ocean rowing boat to ever carry a harley davidson logo on it that's awesome that's quite cool <laughs> <laughs> so um so yeah so we you know we were we were just really business-like in our approach and if you go into it half-heartedly particularly if you're a woman i think you know, people think it's all pink and fluffy and, you know, they're, then they're going to treat you like an imbecile. So you have to overcome that by being absolutely professional in everything you do. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's probably one of the biggest things. Um, Sally Kettle gave me some great advice at the beginning, which was when eating big elephants, take small bites, break everything down into the smallest denomination and build it up from there. Um, I think if you can work with a coach, that's a really good plan. Um, try and control the controllable. So everything that you think of, find a solution to it before you get out to sea and all the way through your campaign. Um, when you are out there, keep a diary and make the most of every day because it's just the most amazing 
place to be it's the most incredible environment to be in and you're amongst a very small group of people that ever do it those are amazing words of wisdom i love every <laughs> single one thank you okay i have to ask my one other question besides bailey's what yep. was your favorite food oh now so my we used to play, <laughs> yeah um we used to play games. Our, our games were mostly food-based. So one of us would burst out of the cabin and say, if you could eat anything in the world right now, what would it be? <laughs> or we'd do like the going on a date thing where you'd pick a celebrity to go on a date with and then have a three-course meal and you'd describe <laughs> everything about the food. So do you mean my favourite food out there? Yep. Yeah. So, so we took some food called Expedition Foods, um, which is a UK brand. I think you can buy it everywhere though. I know a lot of rowers use them. Um, they do an amazing range now. It was a bit more limited when we went, but they did a vegetable tikka curry, which was amazing. And we would, we'd make our meal in the evening and if we couldn't eat all of it then, we'd leave it and it would go cold. But the vegetable tikka you could eat right through the night and it was amazing. Nice. Um, the other thing we did, so I, I'm not really a fan of porridge and we'd taken loads of porridge and just went off it really quickly. Um, but one of the other teams had given us a box of Snickers bars. Mm -hmm. So every day for most of our row was a Snickers bar. You had what, how many days were you at? 70 something? 76. So probably for about, I mean, we had a hundred Snickers bars. Wow. So for most days we were out at sea, we had a Snickers bar and they were amazing because they're a little bit salty, but a little bit sweet. So that was our breakfast most days. Um, but when I came back, couldn't really eat them for a long time afterwards. Even the teeny ones at Christmas, I couldn't eat them. But happily, that's resolved now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I went spent some time in Nepal and it was rice and beans basically is what they eat. And I came back, I was there for two months and I came back and I was like, I can't, I couldn't eat rice and beans for like almost a year and a half. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It does get you a bit like that. But yeah, that, that was probably the favorite food was that, that one particular meal. That was great. You know, Snickers and vegetable that. curry. Yeah. Apart from the Baileys and the little bottles of champagne that we had. So. Which you had every hundred? No. So initially we, so I think we had, I can't remember how many bottles. We had a, a half bottle of champagne for halfway. Okay. And we took a, we were on a TV show and one of the prizes was a bottle of champagne and we took that, that was what we opened at the finish. And so we had, I think it was 12 little baby bottles of champagne and then a load of Bailey's minis. So we'd had, we had, our first one was at 500 miles in and then a thousand miles and then 1500, which was kind of halfway and then 2000. And then we started doing it a bit more often because we realized we'd got plenty left. So. <laughs> uh, I'm definitely gonna follow suit on the mini milestones yeah. and uh, Bailey's sounds delicious. <laughs> yeah, it's great, it's great. But you, you've kind of you need to give yourself those little rewards. You know, we're really bad, particularly British people, at giving ourselves a pat on the back and saying well done. You know, we're really bad at it. You know, and you need to if you set goals for yourself, you need to know when you've achieved them and you need to acknowledge it. Yeah. So our reward of choice just happened to be alcohol. But I um, should say we never had that much, though, because obviously drinking too much out at sea is not a good idea. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was uh, that was our, our reward of choice. <laughs> I like it. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. I really appreciate You're it. You're welcome. I've really uh, enjoyed it. All right, I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. Um, if you aren't familiar, uh, she runs a group for female ocean rowers, people interested and who have done it. I'm going to put that link in the show notes below, uh, but you should definitely check it out. That's where she mention, mentions that she's going to put some forms if you're looking for some fundraising advice. Um, so check that out or reach out to her. Uh, and uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Hit that subscribe button if you liked it. And of course, let me know if there's somebody who you want to have on this podcast or if you want to be on this podcast. I would love to have you. Uh, so I hope you enjoy. The next one's going to be another quick update episode and hope y'all have an amazing day.